On behalf of the Center for Aging, Health and Humanities, I would like to welcome you to the second webinar of our webinar series on building dementia-friendly cities and communities. There will be a Q&A session at the end of the presentation. Uh, questions for the Q&A discussion can be placed into the chat box anytime from the beginning until the end of the presentation. Today, I am delighted to introduce Diane Farsera. Uh, Diane is the um, manager and senior outreach specialist uh, for the University of Wisconsin-Madison School of Nursing Center for Aging, Research and Education, also known as CARE Center. In this leadership role, Diane facilitates communication and collaboration among researchers clinicians, students, organizations, and community members with an interest in older adult health and well-being. She leads the care center efforts to develop an application for family caregivers of older adults and to engage students with dementia-friendly communities. Diane produced content and managed the development of Age Hooli which is an online tool for family caregivers of older adults. She helped design and is the community partner liaison for community supports for people with dementia and co-author the Dementia Friendly Toolkit for uh, university and community audiences, which is currently being extended uh, to hospitals. Today, um, Diane will be talking to us about the Dementia Friendly Toolkit and role play simulations and care and community setting, uh, for community settings. Um, now, um, I would like to turn it over to Diane. Thank you so much for the uh, invitation to address you today. This is something that's near and dear to my heart and I'm so glad to hear that there are dementia friendly efforts that you are involved with in DC. Um, so with that, I will start sharing my screen. And um, so again, I'm very happy to talk with you today about our work uh, at the Center for Aging Research and Education. Uh, and at the School of Nursing for around dementia-friendly community efforts and involving our students so that they become practitioners that are able to provide uh, person-centered care for people living with dementia. Um, so I wanna start just by giving you an overview of what I'll be talking about today. So I wanna provide you with some context uh, for um, the scope of dementia in Wisconsin and the growth happily of dementia friendly community efforts here. The picture on the side is also a reminder to share with you up front that I have a very meaningful personal context as well, which is I am both the daughter and the granddaughter of people who died from Alzheimer's disease. Um, so after providing that context, I'll talk about our varied approaches to engaging our students and our community members in dementia friendly efforts, including a service learning course, the original toolkit, uh, which was really geared towards classroom and community use. And as Maritza um, sort of alluded to, we are um, currently extending that to hospital um, training resources. And then, of course, we'll have time for a discussion. So the context here in Wisconsin, so we know, of course, that age is the top risk factor for um, people to develop um, Alzheimer's disease or other dementias. And like other states um, across the country and places around the world, you know, Wisconsin is aging. What you're seeing on the left is the projection of our population by county out to 2035, where the darker blue colors represent a higher percentage of that county's population being older adults. And so what you'll notice is that there are obviously, we're not evenly aging right here in Wisconsin. And this is true in many other places as well. 
But what we what we have um, here is basically a handful of cities. So Madison, where I am, is in Dane County, which is the green, relatively young um, rectangle in the south central part of the state. So we have a couple other, you know, larger to mid range cities. Um, but then other than that, our state is mostly rural and the more rural the area, the um, older the population is, right? So that means that as uh, the numbers of people living with dementia are increasing um, here in Wisconsin, and then on the right, you'll see some statistics from the most recent Alzheimer's Association fact sheet for, um, for Wisconsin. So our numbers are going up, but they are going up more in rural areas. So these are um, also areas where people generally have fewer resources, where transportation alternatives are hard to come by, where access to care is much more challenging. And often, you know, the, the people who grow up in these areas um, often then decide in their young adulthood to go live somewhere else, right? So this is, this is a challenge that we are trying to address with an eye towards our students, um, but then also communities um, across the state. And so our center here, CARE, you have to have a good acronym, <laughs> the Center for Aging Research and Education, um, has a mission that you'll see there on the left. Um, and we focus in on um, basically three broad categories, which will not surprise you, two are in the name. So, um, you know, we, we try to focus on education to um, ensure that our nursing students and other health sciences students across campus are fully prepared to provide quality care to older adults. Um, we support aging research, and then we also provide evidence-based tools and programming for the elder care workforce. And we define that very broadly to include not just nurses, but um, direct care staff. And of course, the largest segment of the elder care workforce is family caregivers. And so what, what we heard for years um, here at the um, Center for Aging Research and Education, and our founding director, um, Barb Bowers, is in the sort of salmon um, blazer in that picture, but um, in her research um, very much involved family caregivers, she would hear and we heard in, in much of our work that when we're talking to family caregivers of people living with dementia, they would share that some of their most challenging interactions, some of the most stressful interactions actually took place in healthcare settings. And this is um, just, it's, it's horrible, um, you know, and it's something that we felt very much that we had to do everything that we could to address that. You know, these healthcare settings should be the one place, right, where, um, people living with dementia and their family caregivers should be able to go and find understanding and support in a place where um, they can rest assured that they are um, understood and will be um, provided with quality care. And the quote that you see on the right um, was from our current work, uh, one of the family caregivers um, whose person with dementia was recently hospitalized. Um, was sharing this experience and this frustration. So um, when we first started um, almost 10 years ago now to really dig into this and, and try to figure out what we could do, um, at the time there were actually just a few kind of early adopters, leaders um, in Wisconsin where communities were becoming dementia friendly. Um, we're very proud that uh, the McFadden's, and if you have not read, I do highly recommend their book, Aging Together, Dementia, Friendship, and Flourishing Communities. So Susan McFadden is a professor emerita of psychology uh, at UW Oshkosh, and her um, husband, John McFadden, is a pastor. And so they bring this amazing, you know, very um, community and person-centered approach in this book and um, they were in their Fox Valley region really leaders um, in establishing memory cafes, the Fox Valley Memory Center and other approaches to try and make um, 
the community more supportive towards people living with dementia and their family caregivers. Um, when we first got started at CARE to try and figure out what we could do, um, there were no dementia-friendly communities in our county. And so we started involving um, students on independent study arrangements with the closest community, which was Watertown, which is sort of um, an hour to the east on the way to Milwaukee from here. Um, and that was, that was a little bit challenging, um, but happily we did have very um, supportive leadership at the state level at, the point, at that time. And so you'll see on the right of the slide, a um, building dementia friendly communities uh, toolkit that the Wisconsin Department of Health Services put out that had these sort of lessons learned from these pioneer dementia friendly communities in our state and a lot of suggestions on different things that you could, um, uh, you know, different strategies you could adopt, different ways to gather information, different ways to encourage people to volunteer. Um, and that, you know, combined with a lot of, you know, amazing grassroots work that had been going on, you know, in terms of local um, Alzheimer's and dementia advocacy organizations just started to come together around this idea of being dementia friendly and involving wider sectors of the community in these efforts. And so, for example, I'm very happy to say that now we do have a very um, large and very active dementia friendly community in the Madison area and in our, in our broader county, Dane County, and you see in the center there, um, pre-COVID of course, um, one of the wonderful um, accomplishments of the local dementia friendly community network here is they provided training to all the bus drivers in our Madison Metro um, municipal bus service. So really wonderful and really impactful work um, that continues to be done by these grassroots groups. And so that allowed us to transition from doing this independent study involving our students, you know, with this community an hour to the east of us to say, hey, let's, let's develop a full course. Let's get 20, 30 students at a time from uh, disciplines across campus. We felt very strongly that, you know, just like dementia from the communities take a cross sector approach um, that we needed to take a cross discipline approach. And so we, did a lot of outreach to, um, you know, not just the health sciences, but um, business, uh, psychology, um, just all over all, all the therapy um, majors and, uh, and really tried to get as diverse a class as we could, not just nursing and pre-nursing students who are always very eager um, to take this course. So, one of the one of the things where that what makes this a service learning course is that in addition to the classroom content that's really focused on uh, person centered care for people living with dementia personhood, of course, of people with dementia communication, the role of family caregiver and how to support them. Um, equity brain health equity, um, you know, dementia in different communities and supports in different communities. In addition to those topics, all the students must volunteer at least 25 hours across the semester with a community partner. And so this allowed us to, um, to further sort of work in partnership with, again, this wonderful grassroots network that is growing um, in our area that's supporting dementia-friendly community efforts. And the picture that you see at the right is, um, one of our classes a number of years ago with two of the top dementia friendly trainers in the area, Don and John <laughs> from the Middleton Dementia Friendly Community Coalition. And they are just lovely human beings, both of um, whom lost their wives um, to dementia. And they have taken that into um, you know, a volunteer calling. And the quote at the bottom left is perhaps my favorite that we got from one of the students who took the course early on. Um, so as we were um, setting up this course and really happily sort of growing our number of community partners, um, the, the course was first offered in fall of 2016. And over the year, the, the 
um, it's the first meeting for the spring semester will be a week from today. So we're gearing up and we're pairing students with their community partners right now. Um, but over that time, we've worked with 16 different community partners um, and up to 30 different students at a time. So of course, we wanted to put our students in a good position to be able to, um, to succeed in their community placements, some of which did involve directly working with people living with dementia. Others were more sort of, you know, education or outreach or even policy work we have some people do. But so we wanted to train our students not to assume that just because you might have CNA experience that you might have um, training or um, positive experience and positive modeling in how do you communicate with and support people living with dementia. So, um, so we started working with the students to provide training to them um, with an existing sort of off the shelf program. And one thing that we noticed was it was emotionally impactful for our students to go through this training, but it was really difficult to get them to connect those emotions. They would come out saying, I feel so bad. Oh my goodness, I feel so sorry for these people. Um, which is a wonderful human reaction, but it doesn't really help you get to how will you interact, how will you provide care, how will you communicate, and in your professional role, increase supports, right, for people living with dementia. And so we realized, well, we're working so hard after doing this training with them to try and get them to where we want them to be. Um, here we are, you know, these um, experts in simulation and, and active learning, and um, why don't we just make our own? <laughs> and so basically that's what led to our development of the initial um, dementia friendly toolkit. So um, we have in general, you know, a very heavy emphasis here on active learning. Um, we wanted to address both skills and attitudes um, of our students and others who would go through this training, and then as well, be able to identify these common challenges um, and have these real life scenarios that, that are being used in the training in ways that then sensitizes the training participants to, oh, this is a common challenge, but then also introduces them to strategies and resources um, so that they are better able to help um, either avoid or negotiate right, these challenges in the real world. And we, um, as always, and this will come up multiple times, we have, again, these fabulous community partners, these dementia-friendly community groups. And um, during the period that we were coming up with the idea of developing our own toolkit, we talked with them a lot about, you know, would this be useful to you as well? And they, um, a lot of what they do is dementia friendly trainings for local businesses, you know, any sort of agency um, service provider that has, you know, a public facing um, mission, right? And so they go around and, and they do the purple angels, you know, if, if people have been through the, if an institution has been through their training, at least half of frontline staff. Um, and this is all volunteer driven. And, but then each place that they train to be dementia friendly, they encourage them to do refresher trainings every year. So as we were talking about, we are planning on developing these training materials for our students. They said, um, a lot of these community groups said to us, well, I don't know that we would do the role play scenarios that you're talking about. But one thing that we've had so many businesses ask us for is actually short training videos because this is the standard for a lot of, um, you know, larger, especially businesses, is that they'll, they'll have the, the videos on some internal platform and then, you know, the, the staff, as their staff turnover or, or to do the refresher trainings um, the following year, they could use these videos. And we said, well, hey, you know, we're nothing if not ambitious, let's try to make something that everybody can use. So that wound up being a, a modular approach to the toolkit where you have these four training videos, we have these um, six different role play scenarios and you can use them together or separately. Um, and so we wanted to really center 
all of the training materials in the actual challenges that people are facing um, in the community. And so we started with a survey and again, leaned on our wonderful network of dementia friendly community partners who helped us get out this survey to um, not just dementia friendly community groups and um, family caregivers and um, people living with dementia themselves, but all sorts of agencies that they had worked with or even businesses that had been through the training and were really prioritizing this part um, of their interaction with the community. And so we got very um, enthusiastic response right away and it helped us to identify in the role play scenario part of our training toolkit, um, six different settings that we are going to use in the six different role play scenarios. And so you see those listed on the left. And then on the right are just some quotes that um, people had shared with us in one of the free form questions about, you know, what are the, what are the challenges that you most often face or, or that are, you know, most upsetting or, or most difficult for you to deal with. And um, I'm sure a lot of them will resonate with, with things that you've already heard about, right? We often reflect that um, a lot of what we talk about in being dementia friendly is simply taking time and being nice. <laughs> um, kind of a golden rule approach. So, um, so with that, that information, um, again, we work to develop these training materials for our first dementia friendly toolkit and then trialed them with students across campus with different community groups. And so, you know, we're, we're working on what's, what's helpful in terms of the scripts that participants in these role play scenarios um, engage in. Um, to give you a little bit better sense here, so each of the role play scenarios have three or four roles to them. Um, and so generally it's the person living with dementia who you see, um, this is the clinic, these are students, um, graduate DMP students of ours who are trialing the clinic scenario um, in the Dementia Friendly Toolkit. And so you have the um, person living with dementia who has the vision living in goggles and the headphones on and arthritis gloves that you might be able to see she's wearing. And then you have the healthcare provider and then the family caregiver um, who's off to the side. And so each of these uh, role play scenarios is, is structured like that. So it's mirroring a real world challenge. And um, we have the students um, interact um, in different roles over time. And that's something that they've shared is really impactful um, to see also from not just the healthcare provider's role, but from the person living with dementia's role or the family caregiver's role. How did that feel? You know, what was most challenging to you? Um, so what's outlined on this slide is what, after all these trials and seeing, you know, what, what seemed to gel well, um, if you have about an hour in a classroom with students, this is basically what we do. So we show them an introductory video that's understanding dementia for dementia friendly communities. And then we do the first run through of the role play scenario, which um, is the problem, you know, illustrates the problem. And then we have a short discussion of that. And then we provide them with strategies to try and improve that. And that's our communication tips for dementia friendly communities, um, short video. And then we have the students change roles, you know, stay in the same small groups, change roles, um, and then redo the scenario, but go off script as much as they can to improve what is happening for the person living with dementia and their family caregiver. And then we have um, a much longer and, and oftentimes very thoughtful and illuminating um, discussion or debrief of that. And, and I will say, I mean, there were a lot of things that we weren't anticipating at the beginning of this project, um, as, as is true of any good project that you learn along the way, right? But one of them that came out really clearly, um, especially with our um, graduate students or, or other students who have um, significant practice experience, who would say, huh, I always felt like time was the big constraint that I didn't have the time, you know, to do something different. 
But now I realize in doing this, it actually doesn't take more time, right? And so that's that's something that's um, that is very powerful, and we we like to share um, that lesson learned. So. Um, of course, being at a university setting, we have the pre-post survey, <laughs> and this was a um, what we used was a um, dementia attitudes scale that was um, developed actually by Susan McFadden, and um, this is just showing you some of the responses pre and post. But the biggest changes that we did see were the increases in feeling confident. Um, that in, in interacting with people living with dementia, and then the decrease in frustration. And just to just to stress, it's a little um, the scale is is kind of a little shifted for two. So it's an increase in the number of people who disagreed with the statement, "I feel frustrated" or "I feel uncomfortable," is what you're looking at there. And so um, this was really great for us. We were very happy that the um, toolkit seemed to have the impact that we were hoping. Um, we also did have the um, sort of a free form um, questions. And so here are just a few responses of people in the post survey um, shared with us. And so um, I alluded to earlier that these materials were developed very much working with and focused on both our classroom needs and our local dementia friendly community groups. But uh, here at the University of Wisconsin, we have uh, what, what is known as the Wisconsin idea, which in short says that the boundaries of the campus are the boundaries of the state. So, you know, that that's supposed to mean that our campuses are widely accessible and welcoming to the residents of the state, but also that what goes on on campus um, in terms of research and scholarship, especially needs to benefit the people of the state. And so we're very happy that after we developed these, um, the initial dementia friendly training toolkit we were able to get funding that, um, that we could put together, not just the toolkit booklet um, and the videos, which are actually free um, and available on our website, but then the, um, the sort of fancy simulation equipment that we use here and to um, put out a call for community organizations across Wisconsin to say, hey, if you engage in this kind of work or if you would like to, here's your chance to get a free toolkit with simulation equipment. And so we were able to get it out um, to community groups in 52 of our 72 counties. And um, you'll see here the shading of this map is the same as the map you saw earlier. So the darker color is showing where the population is um, aging more rapidly, you know, the more rural areas of the state. And so, you know, there's still, still some counties where we need to, to go out, but we were pretty happy that this initial push um, really did allow us to get to communities statewide. Um, and the quote on the bottom right is from a um, dementia care specialist at, um, at a different county, um, La Crosse County um, Aging Disability Resource Center, who I was actually doing a workshop for a different project that we were on. And then she, as we're there, sort of um, debriefing from that workshop, she said, wait, you know, wait, you're the same people that I got that toolkit from. And I was like, yes, <laughs> that is us. And she just went, you know, just very effusive in how much that that um, has helped in her work. And, and being a, a, um, a good outreach person, I said, can I, can I get a quote for you? So um, I got her in writing. <laughs> um, and so um, this is the um, where you'll find it on our website, um, which the URL is in the lower right of all these slides. But if you go to the projects tab on the main menu, um, and then one of the options under that is Dementia Friendly Toolkit, and you can view any of the four videos right there. Um, and then the toolkit itself is a PDF 
Um, and we confused our finance people by saying we wanted to make that available on a sliding scale. Um, again, very much, you know, coming from that working in partnership with grassroots and often all volunteer organizations. So we say if you're a small group, um, you know, the, the toolkit is one price. If you're a large institution, it's another price. Um, because we certainly did not want um, that to be a barrier to anybody using that who could use those materials. So that sort of describes the, the first toolkit um, that we developed. Again, the focus for community and classroom use. And we put it out there and we're um, very proud of ourselves and you know, sort of trying to get the word out and, and trying to make sure that people know that this is a, a resource that they can use. And we have um, colleagues who are working in acute care settings who said, this is great. Um, the scenarios really don't work for us. And we really, really, really need um, the ability to have dementia friendly training for our staff. Right. And um, to be honest, initially, I was a little skeptical that, are you telling me that there's not? <laughs> there's not already? Uh, apparently, in, in a lot of places, there's not. Um, there's not dementia specific or, or, or a hospital specific dementia friendly um, training for staff. So that is our current project. Um, and so I will. Um, just share a little bit about that. We're about halfway through um, this project, but the, the challenges are very clear, specifically in hospital settings. So, you know, you have um, a large number of older adults who are being admitted to hospitals. Um, many of them are living with some sort of cognitive impairment, often not diagnosed. Um, and then, of course, the outcomes um, are, are much worse um, for people living with dementia or other cognitive impairment um, when they do um, go into the hospital. The environment is confusing for anyone. And then you add you know, the, the, the sounds, the um, sleep disruptions, the, the changes in care, the just never ending parade of changing people. Um, it's, it's a very challenging environment um, for both people living with dementia and their family caregivers. Um, again, we had great community partners here, or I should say maybe um, uh, great partners who um, in, in the hospital space. And so um, we had down the street, literally from the School of Nursing, the first dementia friendly VA hospital in the US. Um, and so we did a lot of um, talking with them early on, as well as down the road from Madison in a community called Stoughton, there's a hospital that um, was a pioneer in being dementia friendly. And so um, what you're seeing here in the picture is that the VA hospital renamed their clinics that used to be by letters. Um, they renamed them to being um, common environments, right, in Wisconsin. So there's there's the fields, there's the lake, there's the, the cabin, you know, that people go to the cabin in the summer um, with pictures, right, um, orienting you. And in addition, of course, to a lot of staff training um, in interacting with people with dementia. So um, just like in our initial toolkit, we wanted to really understand what the challenges were um, as we were developing the second Dementia Friendly Hospitals Toolkit, um, we wanted to ground it in what are the, the common challenges, both from the literature, but also um, engaging people in our community to hear what experiences they've had and what they recommend. And so we did um, some focus groups with family caregivers of people living with dementia who had been in the hospital within the last couple of years. And what you see on the left there are the themes that came out of that focus group. Um, and it was very interesting. So at this point, um, it was during COVID times, and but we were um, talking to people who often had multiple hospital experiences with their family member or loved one who's living with dementia, often both before and during COVID. And so it was a very interesting perspective um, and that really strong theme of 
you have to let us in. We have to be there. And, you know, there's no way that you're going to get the accurate information or there's no way that, um, that the interaction is going to go well um, without us being present. It's very, very clear and very strong. Um, and then two quotes on the right, the upper one very much about um, the challenges around transitions in care. Um, and even just transitions within the hospital, you know, going from room to room, how challenging they can be. And then the bottom quote about staff just not having the training, right? And something that we heard from family members and also from the um, dementia-friendly hospital pioneers in the area was the importance of not just thinking of this as a training that clinical staff needed to have, but that this really needed to be across staff roles, clinical and non-clinical. Because if you're wandering around and having trouble finding where you need to be in the hospital, um, it's most likely right not going to be a clinical staff person who helps you out or you know who answers the phone or what have you. So um, those interactions are, are just as um, important to be able to inform them with an understanding of dementia and um, dementia-friendly communication techniques. And so in addition to talking to the family caregivers um, of people living with dementia, um, we did do a, a survey, again, of hospital staff across roles. And um, what we heard back was, um, to be honest, some things that we can't address in a toolkit, like staffing levels, um, we can't address in a toolkit, but, um, but education training needs were very, um, very clearly identified as well. And in particular, for in the areas that you see listed on the left. And then the quote on the right, again, is from a hospital um, staff member who is just reflecting on um, how challenging the hospital environment can be and those interactions can be. And so um, that is what I have for my presentation. If we do have time, I am um, very happy to play one of, the, um, one of the videos, the communication tips videos, if people are interested. That would, be, can... that would be lovely. Okay. <laughs> All right. So let me do a further test of my screen sharing skills. <laughs> and you'll see me in, in an acting role in this. <laughs> If you've watched our Dementia Basics video, you know that dementia is affecting more people as our population ages. Most people with dementia live in the community, not in nursing homes. So whether you work in healthcare or retail, and whether you live in a small town or city, chances are you do or will communicate with people living with dementia. This video will walk you through 10 communication tips that you can use to make your workplace, family gatherings, neighborhood, religious or social groups more friendly and accessible to people with dementia. People living with dementia often have trouble communicating. They might struggle to find the right word, repeat themselves, get distracted easily, or have trouble following what others are saying. That's because dementia kills brain cells. You probably know that dementia causes memory problems. It also affects other brain or cognitive activities such as attention and planning. Over time, people living with dementia have more and more trouble thinking and carrying out daily routines. For more information about how dementia affects the brain, watch our Dementia Basics video. Everyone needs social interactions to be happy and healthy. And many people with dementia, especially those in the early stages, continue to make healthcare, financial, household, and other decisions about their lives. In this video, we'll give you 10 tips to help you communicate with people living with dementia. We'll also show you what using these tips looks like. 
As you watch this conversation that might happen at a coffee shop, look for these five communication tips in action. Look and sound friendly. Smile. Use a pleasant and calm tone of voice. Make eye contact. Stand or sit where the person can easily make eye contact with you without moving their head. Speak slowly and clearly. Speak in a low tone and at a normal volume. Use gestures or other visuals to help the person picture what you're saying. Be patient. Give the person time to process what you said and then respond to it. Let's see an example of a barista interacting with someone who has dementia. Here's your coffee, sir. That'll be two sixteen. Sorry, uh, uh, how much was the coffee? Um, that'll be two sixteen, sir. Go ahead, take your time. There's no rush. I'll be with you in just a minute, ma'am. Thank you. Can can I get some half and half for my coffee, please? Yes, of course. Here's your ten cents change, and the half and half will be right around the corner for you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, and you have a great day. Thank you. That would have been a pleasant interaction for anyone. The barista was friendly and patient. She spoke clearly and waited until the person with dementia was ready before saying something else. She made eye contact and used hand gestures to illustrate what she was saying. She encouraged other customers to be patient, making her shop even more welcoming for people with dementia, as well as their family caregivers. Now let's add more tips to our communication toolbox. As you watch this conversation that might happen in a restaurant, look for these five communication tips in action. Simpler is better. Ask the person one question or share one piece of information with them at a time. Pay attention to the person's body language. You may be able to tell from their facial expression if they understand you and feel comfortable. If the person doesn't seem to understand you, pause. Then repeat your last point using different and simpler words. Listen carefully to what the person says and how they say it. Show that you're listening and you understand them by agreeing with or restating the point that they made. Depending on the person and the situation, lightly touching their hand, arm, or shoulder can be reassuring. Just like other people, some people with dementia are okay with being touched and others aren't. Watch their body language and give them the space that they need to feel comfortable. Hello and welcome. Can I get you two something to drink while you're looking at our menu? Dad, would you like something to drink? Yes, yes I, would. I would. Okay, great. Would you like a cold drink? No, I think a cup of coffee. Okay, great. One coffee and then one iced tea, please. I'll get those right away for you two. Thank you. Right, here is your iced tea and your coffee. Are you ready for me to take your order? Do you know what you would like for lunch, sir? I I, I don't know. The menu is so long. I need more time to look at it. I know. We have a very long menu. It is a long menu. And the print can be larger for my eyes, even. Dad, does a sandwich sound good? Yes, that sounds good. OK, great. We can go through the sandwich choices together. Uh, I can give you a few minutes. I'll be right back to take your order. Okay, thank you. The waiter and the family caregiver both helped make the information that restaurants can bombard us with easier for the person with dementia to handle. The waiter paid attention to the person with dementia's body language. When the person with dementia seemed confused, the waiter used simpler words to repeat his last point. The family caregiver helped her father narrow in on simpler choices, like a hot versus cold drink or different sandwich options. She got her father's attention before speaking to him. Both the waiter and family caregiver respond to the frustration that the person with dementia was feeling by acknowledging it and agreeing that the menu was a little challenging. If you practice these 10 communication tips, you'll turn them into good habits. There's no need to wait to use them until you're talking with someone who you know or think may be living with dementia. Everyone appreciates clear, friendly, and calm communication. When you are talking with someone who's living with dementia, remember that communication isn't just about words. We tell people how we feel through our facial expressions, tone of voice, gestures, and body language. The environment can also affect how well the conversation goes. People with dementia often have trouble focusing. Quiet spaces with good lighting and fewer distractions make it easier for people with dementia to have conversations. The more you interact with people living with dementia, the more you'll see that everyone has their own personality, strengths, and challenges living with the condition. 
every person with dementia is going to have some good days and some bad days. If someone with dementia is having a bad day, try not to take their frustration, anger, or other negative reactions personally. Think of these 10 communication tips as different tools in your toolbox. No one tool will magically work in every conversation with any person living with dementia. Be flexible and willing to try different approaches. The important thing is that you're making an effort and treating the person with dementia as a respected adult with their own needs, wants, and wishes. That is what will make our communities more friendly and accessible to people with dementia. All right. I just realized I was talking to myself. I was muted. <laughs> Thank you so much. Great, great presentation. Thank you. I have a comment here in the chat box from Mary Proctor. She, it's just a comment. She said, all these skills are doubly important if the person living with dementia who is also hard of hearing, which is definitely true. Yes. Yes, definitely. And that's, yeah, we, uh, we often talk about um, when we prepare the students for the simulations and we orient them to the, the equipment that we use, we make the point that um, the equipment that we use, the goggles, the headphones, and, and playing in the headphones are um, ambient audio um, from the setting that, is, that the scenario is, is based in. Um, so the restaurant one is particularly loud, um, but, and, and sometimes gloves as well. But um, we do tell our students like, look, this is our best way to be able to approximate, you know, sort of what it might be like to be living with dementia in terms of, we're gonna make it harder for you to be able to get in and act on new information. So you know things that are happening around you that are relevant to you, but we're, you're not getting you know, all of what's being said and you're not um, able to see details, but please don't assume from that that everyone living with dementia is, you know, has hearing loss or everyone living with dementia um, has you know, very limited eyesight. But of course, you know, sensory changes with age mean that a lot of people do. Um, have both sensory limitations and are living with dementia. I, I have a, a, a quick question about the, the training um, uh, of students. Um, do they volunteer to take the training in dementia friendly or is it part of a course? How, how would you uh, encourage students to participate? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. So we, um, we have incorporated it into a couple different courses um, mm -hmm. here in the School of Nursing with, so we have our, our service learning course, which is where it started. And so um, we do the training with, with those students. And then we do have um, a graduate um, course at the School of Nursing that does, so we have undergraduates and graduates. Um, we, and then we have some um, folks across campus we know who are using it with their courses, you know, every time that course is offered. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, it's been a while to be honest, since, well, COVID, but um, <laughs> it's been a while since we've done um, events, but when we, it, and offered that training as a part of an event, or sometimes we do open skills labs, um, you know, with our students and we can offer that as, as a part of that as well. In terms of the process of developing the toolkit, how, how, how long did it take um, to develop the, the, the toolkit? Um, how, how many people were involved in, in, in the process? Yeah, so the, the original toolkit is, um, we, it, we had a year um, to, to work on it and there were four of us. And so um, it was myself, um, two clinical faculty members and a tenure track faculty member so um, two of the faculty members have, you know, either research programs and or clinical practices that very much involve um, people living with dementia and their family caregivers. And then another of the clinical faculty members um, is an expert in, um, in simulation uh, education. 
And so, um, so yeah, that's that's the team that um, that put together the initial toolkit, and we joked about bringing the band back together <laughs> to make the hospital toolkit. So we have the um, the same four um, who are working on the hospital toolkit, and that is a longer process. Um, and to be honest, one of the challenges. So we're that's a two year process um, as initially envisioned. Um, and so we are just starting the, the second year of that two year project for the dementia friendly hospital toolkit. And we've already reworked the project timeline a few times because we have um, hospitals who have agreed to pilot and give us feedback on these materials. But, um, you know, we don't want to we don't want to ask of hospitals, you know, to put anything more on people's plates when they're dealing with um, either surges of, of sick people or um, more happily when they were dealing with surges of people coming in to get vaccinations. So um, it's a little challenging, but, but we are hopeful that by the end of this year, we will um, have the materials vetted and, and um, have that feedback from our hospital pilot partners. Yeah, thank you. And I do see a question um, um, about how to access the materials. Um, so I will take the opportunity to share the direct um, URL in the chat. Um, and so again, if you go there, the, um, the training, there are four different um, videos, training videos, each eight to 10 minutes long that are freely available. You can watch the whole thing. Please do use them. We put them out there for people to use, you know, if they are useful to you. Um, and then the toolkit, we do have, um, you have the purchase link from there. And then again, there is a sliding scale, um, uh, you know, sort of um, on your honor if you're, <laughs> if you're with a small organization or with a large um, organization. Oh, and I'm Sorry, I got that as a direct message and I replied as a direct message. So I will send it again to everyone to see. Okay, yeah, now I got, I got it. <laughs> now you got it. Thank you. I have one last question about, um, I, I, I'm aware of the, um, um, the uh, Wisconsin Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. Um, I, I was curious how, how much care interacts with uh, the Wisconsin Alzheimer's Disease uh, Research Center? I know that there are some faculty uh, um, who are uh, participating on both care and also the Wisconsin ADRC, but I know that the Wisconsin ADRC have an education core. Mm -hmm. And these are the type of things that, um, that I think that they would be really, really interested in, 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 in getting involved. Yeah, that's a that's a great point. So we we have um, and actually some of our pilot um, our piloting of the initial toolkit was done in conjunction with the um, Wisconsin Alzheimer's Disease Research Center, and then there's also um, in the med school as well here um, a Wisconsin Alzheimer's Institute. Yes. And so right, and so we um, we did work with with them. Um, to um, on on the pilots and then in general, um, you know the Wisconsin. I believe it's the Wisconsin Alzheimer's Institute that has a dementia resource network where they also do outreach statewide to different groups. And so, um, you know, we definitely um, communicated and and they were kind enough to share information about our um, dementia friendly toolkit with that network as well. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, wonderful. Yeah, I know. I know many. I used to work there. So. Oh, nice. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, in another life. Um, <laughs> well, thank you so much. This has been so informative. Excellent presentation. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's my pleasure. And, you know, if people have other questions, feel free to, um, to email me and very happy to. Um, and also, I mean, if you have insight, if you have you know, hospital focus as well. Um, like I said, we're only halfway through that project. So we're very much still in the information gathering phase and, um, and putting those draft materials together at this point. So um, welcome participation um, on that as well. Thank you. Well, um, it's 1154 and um, 
I don't see any more uh, questions in the chat box. Um, therefore, I would like to thank everyone for joining us today. And we look forward to having you again in our next webinar to be held on Tuesday, February 1st at noon. Um, we will be talking about environments to improve the quality of life of people living with dementia. Thank you, everyone, and uh, take care. Bye-bye.